Hey, soccer fans, this is Nick with the Feed the Fire podcast, and we are back after the two play-in games to kick off the MLS 2024 postseason are now in the books. A wild 2-2 draw resulting in Atlanta advancing on penalty kicks over Montreal, and perhaps an even more wild 5-0 victory of the Vancouver Whitecaps over the Portland Timbers, the home team playing away with the major victory. I said we'd talk about it in the last episode, but we went way long, and now we're going to talk about it here today. We are also going to take a look at some breaking news from the world of MLS scheduling and a consideration of maybe going to a fall spring schedule, more aligning with some of the other major leagues in the world. We'll look at the article from The Athletic about that. I also first want to encourage everyone, especially you Fire fans, head over to ESPN.com find an article by Cesar Hernandez titled The MLS Trophy Nobody Wants, How the Wooden Spoon Came to Be. It gives you some great history of the wooden spoon and how it started with Chicago Fire fans and their desire to make their club and other clubs accountable for poor seasons when there's no relegation in the league. Again, this isn't a pro-rail discussion, but that's part of their basis behind it. There's some cool anecdotes from the creators, from people who've, uh, from supporters groups who've held the wooden spoon for several seasons in a row sometimes in the case of Cincinnati and San Jose, but it's a great article. Go check it out. Learn a little of your Major League Soccer history and learn a little bit of your Chicago Fire history. Now, getting back to the MLS playoffs picture, the wild card rounds, the play-in game rounds, were held over the last couple of nights on October 22nd and October 23rd. The Montreal Atlanta game was a fun one to watch. This ended up in a 2 2 draw, but not for lack of either team trying to win it. Atlanta took an early 2 0 lead, and they went into the half up 2 0. And the start of the second half. To me, it's, it was almost reminiscent of some of these Chicago Fire teams from the past few years who you just know when you're not scoring certain goals, the other team is going to come back and salvage a result against you. And that's exactly what happened here. Atlanta controlled a lot of the second half, the first part of the second half, I should say, but couldn't find the back of the net. They were getting in great positions. They were making the runs. They were getting the shot offs, but they were just not placed well or just didn't have enough power to get it past Montreal's keeper. And sure enough, Joseph Martinez pounces on a loose ball in front of the box, makes it a one-goal game. Then Atlanta gets called for a foul in the box. Penalty kick, who else? But Joseph Martinez levels it. And all of a sudden, now he's barking at his former teammate, Brad Guzan. It's a 2-2 game. It goes into PKs. And who's the first shooter? That's right, Joseph Martinez, who buries it. So that's two PKs he converted in that match, one in the shootout, one as part of the regular time in the game, but it all came down to uh, Atlanta's ability to convert their five PKs and Guzan making a save uh, against one of Montreal shooters, and now Atlanta will advance to face Miami. So let's stick with the Eastern Conference for a little bit here. Uh, Miami is hosting Atlanta on October 25th. That's when the first of this best of three series starts, and it goes uh, every several days, October 25th, November 2nd, and then November 9th. So just about every every week they're playing a game here. So they're really stretching out these playoffs here. Uh, that's for sure. Now looking at this matchup, I mean, you have to take Miami in it if if you're picking rationally, if you're picking uh, for gambling reasons. You've got the best team over the course of the season, record-setting team, 74 points, Supporter Shield winners. They have looked practically unstoppable and haven't been stopped by any team with one tiny possible exception. And that possible exception is the five stripes, is Atlanta United. They have had arguably the most success against Miami since Leo Messi has come into Major League Soccer. So this is not going to be a cakewalk for Miami by any means, uh, but I expect Atlanta to come out and really rough this game up, make it physical, uh, just try and drag this these games out as long as they can to really kind of wear down this Inter-Miami team over the course of a three-game series. Maybe steal, uh, maybe get a couple early goals and try and put Miami, give Miami the pressure of 
forcing plays instead of just allowing them to happen as we've seen because they are so good technically tactically and so patient uh, maybe if they can force Miami into uh, forcing their game we'll say then Atlanta could have an advantage there but it's going to take a near perfect game from Atlanta and when they're not converting chances like they did in the second half against Montreal that will open the door for Miami to come in and slam in three four goals against them especially if you're if Miami wants to play quickly on the counter uh, like we've seen they can do during some of these games so if it were up to me, I'm going to have to take the, the betting favorite here, the obvious favorite. I'm going to pick Miami to advance. But man, what I love to see Atlanta United knock off the Supporter Shield winner. And from what we discussed in a prior episode, about a third of the teams that, that win the Supporter Shield end up in the MLS Cup Final. And only a handful have actually won the Shield Cup double. So it's not Totally unreasonable to expect Miami to run the table this postseason, uh, but they've got to get through one of their tougher opponents over the course of the season in Atlanta United. Now, the winner of that series will end up playing the winner of Orlando and Charlotte, and this is going to be a tough one to pick. Orlando was the team that was supposed to come in with a lot of promise this season, didn't really live up to it the first half of the season, kind of found their groove late, playing the Chicago Fire twice later on in the season certainly helps um but orlando it should be the favorite here right i think they were the higher seed let me pull up my standings just just to make sure i can remember that uh but this should be orlando's series to lose obviously we know how good christian kalina is likely going to be named uh goalkeeper of the year for the mls postseason awards uh we know that charlotte can find the back of the net they've got 46 goals on the season so not a lot compared to a lot of other teams here but still their their goal differential is plus nine so they can score just enough in order to advance and over the course of a three game series it's going to be a tough go of it and yes orlando city finished fourth in the standings and charlotte ended up finishing fifth so this is going to be one of those exciting series. These are the kind of matchups where I like having uh, a three-game uh, set on it because you're going to get to see this exciting matchup uh, for three games. Now, I do give Orlando the edge. I'm going to pick Orlando to advance here. Uh, and unless Atlanta somehow upsets Miami, I think Miami would beat Orlando in the semifinals there uh in the conference semifinals i should say so i've got miami over atlanta i've got orlando over charlotte i think orlando has a little bit more firepower on offense despite as good as uh, charlotte's defense and kalina has been and despite their offense being able to find just enough when they need it now looking at the bottom half of the bracket we have cincinnati and new york matching up in the next series cincinnati the three seed new york city as the six seed I have to go with Cincinnati in this matchup. New York has been, for the most part, uh, up and down. I, I sh maybe I shouldn't say that for the most part, up and down. But they have had their ups and downs in this season. More, more ups than downs, obviously, coming in in a six spot, finding uh, a postseason berth. But when you look at their 50-point total, not too much ahead of the Red Bulls, but definitely ahead of the 8-9 seed. So they did really separate themselves from the bad teams. But when I, I want to look at their schedule here and see who they actually played this season uh, and, and ended up, if they have, any sort of big wins on the season and can they get it done in the playoffs over this three-game series against Cincinnati. Now, when they played Cincinnati back uh, in March... Cincinnati ended up with a 1-0 victory. That was in Cincinnati. When New York hosted Cincinnati in August, that was a 4-2 Cincinnati victory. So Cincinnati's 2-0 against NYC in the regular season with a 5-2 aggregate score there. So New York had not been able to figure them out during the regular season. I don't expect them to do that in the postseason. I think Cincinnati is just too good. I don't think New York is as consistent as... Uh, on offense and playing at that highest level to win two of three games against FC Cincinnati, and I'll take them to win. And then the final matchup in the Eastern Conference, Columbus Crew against New York Red Bulls. Uh, the Crew finishing in the number two seed in the Eastern Conference, and 
man, but but for a few other t extra tournaments, they would have given Miami a run for their money there towards the end of the season. Uh, and they are matching up with the New York Red Bulls, who finished seventh. This is an intriguing matchup here. And again, one of those where I'm excited to see these three-game series uh, being played. These are two teams who just wrapped up the regular season against each other at Red Bull Arena. Columbus comes away with a, an exciting 3-2 victory, and now they get to play them three more times at most. So this could be a, pretty much a four-game series if you think about it. But when uh, New York traveled to Columbus, when the Red Bulls traveled to Columbus, their result all the way back in March was a 3-0 Columbus thumping. So Columbus has beaten the Red Bulls now seven, I'm sorry, six to two on aggregate during the regular season, two wins to the crew. So they are the clear favorites in this matchup. They are the clear favorites to meet Miami in the conference uh, finals. But New York can make it a game. If we look at New York's run of form, and let me just pull up their schedule while I do this. You can tell I'm kind of freewheeling things here tonight uh, just because I wanted to get something out before we get these first playoff matches going. If you look at the Red Bulls' recent run of form, they have not scored more than two goals since the end of July. So right before, actually the beginning of July, before League's Cup. Mid-July? End of July? I don't know. can't remember exactly. Uh, so the Red Bulls don't appear to have the offensive firepower to deal with the Columbus crew. And that's why I'm picking the crew. Not only are they the best team that's not Inter-Miami, they're, they're just the, a better team than the Red Bulls. The Red Bulls don't have the offensive firepower to do it. This could be a two-game sweep for the Columbus crew. All right, now uh, that means the crew would move on to play FC Cincinnati. And wow, wouldn't Ohio soccer fans love to see that? I will give the edge to Columbus. Again, they're the best team that's not Inter Miami in, in the league. Maybe you got a shout for the two LA teams to step in, but the way they've been playing and now that they're singularly focused on the postseason, I do expect Miami and Columbus to meet in the conference finals. <sighs> Man. Do I wait and give you my finals picks until at all? No, I'll probably forget to do it. Might as well do it now. I want to pick Columbus. I really, really want to do pick. I'm going to pick Columbus. I'm going to pick Columbus to represent the Eastern Conference in the finals. I, I think that they will be able to figure out Miami. I think they are the most disciplined team defensively. I think they will be able to possess the ball on offense and kind of force Miami to spread out. And I think they will shut down any sort of counterattacks that Miami can uh, could try to muster. And I think the Columbus crew end up beating Inter-Miami in the conference finals sending them to to the MLS Cup again. Now that's my Eastern Conference kind of 10,000 foot view here. And if you want to look at the Western Conference now, again, Vancouver had that wild 5-0 victory at Portland. And as we all know, you know, even though Vancouver was the 8 seed and should have hosted the game, there was a motocross, supercross event scheduled at their stadium. So they had to go to Portland to play a home game and ended up drubbing them. 5 nothing. If you haven't heard the post-game comments from Vanny Sartini, go listen to them. Uh, before the game, Phil Neville said, God must be a Timbers fan for them to have this luck where they're getting uh, getting a home game as the away team in the wild card round. But then after the game is over, Vanny Sartini commented saying, I'm an atheist. It doesn't mean God doesn't mean anything to me. I just believe in the supporters, and they believe in God, and they believe in us. So it was some great post game comments by Vanny Sartini. Uh, but Vancouver absolutely manhandled the Timbers. That first half looked like an offense defense drill that you run at an inter squad scrimmage or practice. They were just constantly getting the ball in dangerous areas, creating opportunities. My heart goes out to my fellow Greek, James Bondemis, who ended up starting in net for Portland. And there was some talk that maybe Kripo should have started. Or, I'm sorry, is, is, is that correct? Am I remembering uh, these articles correctly? Here, let me look up uh, the Portland Timbers roster. Yeah, Maxime Kripo is, is playing keeper for them. Um, there was some talk maybe they should have started Kripo, but honestly, when you give up five goals, that's not on the keeper. That is on the defense. And watching the first three that went in, Pandemis is making one and two saves before 
the goal gets scored. It's like the third and fourth opportunity in some of these attacking sequences where Vancouver is scoring goals. That's on the defense. That's not on the keeper. So Portland's got a lot to think about in the offseason. Phil Neville's got a lot to think about in the offseason. Ownership and management has a lot to think about in the offseason because if you like post-game comments, go find Evander's Twitter feed where he essentially calls out the front office for the reason that they are the reason that the Timbers didn't win. And I, my first thought was, um, are, are you, the front office didn't play defense, dude. <laughs> like, you guys are the ones on the pitch. And I think Phil Neville will be one of the first people to say that the players have to make the plays. You can't go around blaming other people outside of that locker room, coaches included probably. I bet Phil would acknowledge that as well, that, that they could have made some different adjustments or he could have prepared them better. Uh, I think they kind of just took it for granted to a certain degree that they're playing at home when they shouldn't have been and got the win uh, and were going to get the win, even though it's not how it played out. Uh, but yeah, Evander calls out ownership in the front office for for the failures of the club this season, the shortcomings of the club this season. Uh, and it turns out, as Tom Bogert reported on his SoccerWise channel, that there had been ongoing contract discussions between Evander and the Portland Timbers that had stagnated, and there was a lot of frustration and a little bad blood on both sides, and so he was venting that even further. The other thing Tom Bogert said was after this game, um, ownership came down, and or, or the general manager came down to, and talked to the Timbers in the locker room after the game and talked about having a disappointing season. I'm like, dude, your team just got thumped 5 nothing. Don't go down there with anything to say other than, hey, good game, good game. You tried, good game. That's it. That's all you gotta do. After a 5 nothing loss like that, after you know there's bad blood, just go down there and say good game. Don't start causing fissures between ownership, front office, and coaches and players there. But continuing on now, Vancouver is going to advance, and they are playing LAFC starting on October 27th and then uh, November 3rd and 8th. This is an interesting matchup. There is a lot of rivalry between these two teams because they have met so many times in the postseason. I think Vancouver is going to want to play LAFC similar to how they played Portland, where it's just attack, 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 and every first ball is going to go forward. However, LAFC... Yeah, they have a very, very good counterattack that is going to catch Vancouver off on times. Portland also had a very good counterattack. I don't think they were playing it as effectively in this game, clearly with a 5 nothing scoreline. Uh, but where LAFC is going to be a lot better is in the center of the pitch, the defensive mids and the center, center backs condensing, marking inside the box, not allowing those free shots, not allowing those runners to roam without someone putting a body on them or making sure that they do get marked on a give and go. So Vancouver, they're going to play their same brand that we saw against Portland. LAFC is just going to do a much better job than Portland defending, transitioning, and counterattacking. And LAFC, top seed in the Western Conference, got to give it to them as well for that reason. So I think LAFC advances, and I think they will move on to play Houston. There's just something about Houston this season. I know they're going up against Seattle, who usually saves it all up for a postseason run. And man, how much would the people of LA and Seattle love another LAFC Seattle Sounders playoff match in the conference semifinals? But I just think this is Houston's year. You know, Houston ended up in the five seed, three points behind Seattle. But also, Houston, big news, Coco Karaskia named CONCACAF Player of the Year, probably for all his uh, accolades with the Panamanian national team this season, and maybe a little bit less of him being in Major League Soccer. And there's a lot of flack with that announcement. One, uh, saying that I think there were some Panamanian voters on there, so of course they're going to vote for their guy. And number two, how can the best player in CONCACAF be playing in Major League Soccer and not a big European league. But I think it just shows you that it was weighted towards how who the voters were and his accomplishments with the Pan Panamanian national team. But whatever your take is on that, uh, the fact remains, I'm giving the edge to Houston in this one. And then I think LAFC do advance past Houston to get into the conference finals. Looking at the bottom half of the bracket, we've got RSL and Minnesota. RSL the three seed, Minnesota the six seed. 
you know, Minnesota's really come into their own the second half of the season, but I just don't think they have the offense that RSL does that will carry a team uh, in these three-game series. And everyone says defense wins championships. Uh, but I think over the course of this first round, I think that RSL's offense is going to uh, carry the series. And you can say defense wins championships, but the best defense is a good offense. And I think RSL has the edge there. 65 goals on the year to Minnesota's 58. And with RSL having a much, much better home record, 11-3-3, whereas Minnesota has an 8-6-3 away record. Again, if you want to look at that sort of thing, the edge goes to RSL. Now, how did these two teams match up during the regular season? Can that give us any sort of glimpse into what we can expect uh, when they meet in the first round of the playoffs. Let me pull it up here, going way back to the top of the schedule. They met in April in Minnesota, and it was a 1-1 draw. So RSL got the road point uh, at Minnesota. And then the next time that they met, why can't I find it here? What's going on with the scheduling thing? Um, the next time they met was in October in RSL, and it was 0-0. So... I was talking about RSL's offense, one goal in two games against Minnesota in the regular season, and each game resulted in a draw. So these are going to be tight ones, and that is why I will give the edge to RSL's offense. I think they are going to meet the LA Galaxy in the conference semifinals. The Galaxy, who finished second in the Western Conference due to a tiebreaker with LAFC, both had the same amount of points. Both had the same amount of wins, uh, but it was goal differential by a single goal. 20 plus 20 goal differential for LAFC plus 19 goal differential for the Galaxy, and that's what slipped them down into the two spot against Colorado. I, I just think the Galaxy are are the better team, hands down. Better roster. Um, I don't want to say better coaching, but their their tactics really fit their style of play and they know how to exploit the opponents uh they're just the better team they've been on a tear uh for large chunks of this season let's take a look at their schedule and see how they looked against colorado throughout the course of the regular season also i do think colorado has had on occasion some inconsistent play and when you're playing a three game series first round that to me it, it can be a deciding factor or a factor, a contributing factor, that you've got to do it over three games now, and usually uh, the talent wins out. Everyone says that the reason MLS went to the three-game first round is for TV money, more ticket sales, all that stuff, more buzz, something unique. But also, they, they want the better teams to win. And over the course of a three-game series, typically the better team will, will pull it out. So here, looking at L.A., playing Colorado. They played back in July and the, at LA, and the Galaxy ended up with a 3-2 victory, and then they played again in October, and the Galaxy had a 3-1 victory. So the Galaxy have scored six goals in two games against the Rapids this season, and unless the Rapids play a perfect game and somehow get the Galaxy off theirs, I think that this is a Galaxy win. And I think that the Galaxy uh, go on to beat RSL in the semis, and we have an LA LAFC matchup in the conference finals. And at that point, oh my goodness, Galaxy and LAFC, I mean, the, that rivalry, having El Trafico in, in the conference finals is absolutely wild. But in this case, when they've gotten through this part of the playoffs, I'm going to give the edge to LAFC, uh, just not only because the teams finished practically even in the regular season standings, but I think LAFC has built out that depth and, depth and that will carry them throughout the course of the playoffs into the finals, where we've got LAFC, where we've got Columbus, where we've got a rematch, folks. And for that, I think LAFC finally gets it done. I'm taking LAFC to go all the way in this tournament. All right, let's take our halftime water break here and recognize our sponsor, Skira Icelandic Spring Water. Icelandic for clear, Skira comes from water in a government-protected nature preserve in Iceland. Skira Icelandic for clear, available at your local 7-Eleven. Go out, grab a bottle, two, three, stay hydrated all throughout these MLS Cup playoffs. 
All right, and as we get into a very, very short second half of this episode, I wanted to discuss an article that was published in The Athletic by Paul Tenorio today, or yesterday, October 23rd. And the article is titled, MLS is considering changing to a fall spring calendar after the 2026 World Cup. And, you know, it's it's a lengthy article. You got to give The Athletic credit. They, they definitely get their hosting fees worth of these these long form articles uh but let's let's quickly run down it and and i'll read it as quickly as i can and give give my interjections as we go mls is considering overhauling its calendar flipping to a fall spring season with breaks in the summer and winter multiple sources briefed on the league's discussions tell the athletic mls executives and owners have been weighing the changes to the calendar which they believe will help maximize the league's participation in the global transfer market among other benefits the hope is for the league to institute the changes as early as the summer of 2026 coming out of the world cup all right i'm going to pause here real quick and talk about uh the global transfer market we know we have the summer window and the winter window the winter window globally is the secondary transfer window, but that is when MLS is in its off season and it's become kind of MLS's primary window. So that would align globally. Now, what, why does that make a difference? The transfer window is a transfer window, right? Well, for MLS clubs, what we have seen as a trend lately is international or foreign clubs make the most of their moves over the summer during their off season, right? Similar, just like MLS clubs make most of their moves in the winter in their off season. So when they're trying to acquire players, when they're ready to spend, when they're ready to start getting into bidding wars, that's the middle of the MLS season. And we have seen uh, frequently in recent MLS history that MLS will transfer some of their players during the summer window, but want a loan back to complete the rest of the MLS season if they think they have the chance to win a trophy with these high demand players here, with the players they're about to transfer. And also, you're you're seeing MLS clubs have to make the decision of, do we take a bigger payday? Do we take a lesser payday? Do we try to restructure a deal uh, in order to keep these players or do we cash out? This would help Major League Soccer front offices have that decision either made for them or be a little bit of an easier decision to make. And when MLS is building their own rosters now, they have uh, a lot more time to, to structure their rosters internally. There would probably have to be some tweaking of some of these rules if they are going to go to a fall spring calendar instead of the current spring fall calendar. Maybe they have to relook at the DP rules, the U22 rules, some of the recent changes they instituted. Uh, but I think it would help MLS in negotiating with foreign clubs because as we know now, foreign clubs also aren't really sure of a lot of how MLS deals are structured, and maybe that scares away some some clubs. Now, the ones who want to get it done, they're going to get it done, and we're seeing more and more MLS players go overseas, but still, that is one concern that can be addressed. Okay, the article continues. MLS Executive Vice President of Sporting Product and Competition, Nelson Rodriguez, told The Athletic, it is still too soon to know if MLS will institute changes or what those changes could be. Uh, yeah, Fire fans, that's right. Nelson Rodriguez, he is highly involved in this and will be quoted throughout this article. The same Nelson Rodriguez that pretty much destroyed the Chicago Fire and has failed upward into the high-ranking executive ranks of Major League Soccer. Uh, the article continues quoting the aforementioned Nelson Rodriguez. We have been engaged really since January, and it's been very extensive and exhaustive and deliberate. It's still too early. We're still asking questions. We're still collecting and analyzing some data. We're still formulating models. Some of those models are for formats themselves. Some of those models are how to assess the information we get. So he's got concepts of a plan. <laughs> Can we say that? Or he he's having meetings about meetings kind of a thing at this point. Uh, but what, what a lot of people have looked at is some of this data. Uh, I, obviously, the first reaction for fans is how are teams in Toronto or Chicago or Colorado or New York going to be playing in the winter time? Uh, so a lot of the data is probably going to be looking at, at some of this weather and whether they can structure those teams to have more away games during the coldest parts of this of the season. Some of the other data we're hearing talked about uh, through just kind of speculation on social media channels is attendance records. How does attendance work during 
uh, certain times of the year during certain games, Saturday games to Sunday games to Wednesday games, uh, things of that nature. So they're really looking at all that because at the end of the day, they want to do what's most profitable for the owners and what is going to position the league to continue to grow in profitability as well as success and influence on the global market. So if they are going to look at these models, everything is being studied, not just weather, not just indoor outdoor stadiums, not just scheduling, but also attendance trends and habits, and probably even moving around some of these TV schedules. Because that's another thing they've got to remember when they're changing the schedules around, is now you'll have more competition from college football, NFL, basketball, and hockey. And I was talking to uh, a, a friend of mine here, I'm pulling up his information so you guys can all go find and follow him as well on social media. I was talking with Mr. Nathan Durek over at the Terminal City FC show, uh, and he's saying, yeah, so Vancouver fans love their Whitecaps, but they love their Canucks even more. And if it came down to a hockey game or a soccer game, Canadian fan base would definitely prefer going to a hockey game or watching a hockey game. So that is going to be studied as well. And I think also with the schedule, what they need to do is look at putting uh, some games spread out over the course of the day instead of having, you know, two start times or three start times on a Saturday. For me, I love going to my Chicago Fire games live and in person, but then that kills my entire day of watching any games. If there was one on when I got home that evening or one on earlier in the afternoon, uh, that would be excellent to see. Or even when the Fire are away and I am watching on my couch, I'd like to be able to watch more than two games like full games, enjoy it. I get that they're trying to do the the whip around show on MLS, but it's it, the way they're working on it, the way it's working out right now is it is just too too disjointed. And, and honestly, I think there's too much going on with the hosts and the show and the graphics and everything like that. So I would love to see this also push a change in the, in the scheduling of kickoff times. All right, the article continues. A change would certainly impact MLS's competition in the American sports calendar. The MLS Cup playoffs, which started this week, are up against the MLB playoffs, college football, and the NFL, as well as the NBA, college basketball, and NHL regular seasons. Under the new calendar, the playoffs would likely be played in April and May, with most of the competition coming from the Stanley Cup playoffs, the NBA postseason, and the start of the MLB season. So we kind of talked about that already. MLS is holding group meetings with sporting directors, chief business officers, and owners. Rodriguez said the league has also done extensive fan polling, and we're going back into the field with another fan survey. So be on the lookout for that, fans. Another survey coming your way. Uh, the league is also planning to have fan and player focus groups to gauge interest and hear concerns about changes because the, this impacts the entire ecosystem, quote unquote, according to Rodriguez. So why make the changes? We're moving into the, to the why. We got some of the facts in the background. Now the why. Altering the schedule could have multiple benefits from a competitive standpoint, from syncing up the league's transfer windows with the European calendar to maximizing the visibility of the playoffs in the American sports calendar. The vast majority of global transfer business is done in the summer window. That currently falls in the middle of the MLS season, which creates conflicts for teams hoping to buy and sell players. A problem that has been felt more acutely as MLS teams have become more active in the international market. Teams that want to sell players in the summer when they are in their highest value must weigh losing some of their best players in the middle of the season with little time to replace them. The MLS and League's Cup schedule also means summer signings arrive with fewer than 10 games left in the regular season. That's a big one. That was one thing I jokingly said is if they are going to go to a fall spring schedule, hey, look, they're, they're addressing the summer congestion issue that they kind of created by having League's Cup. So now we can play League's Cup without any problems because it's in the middle of the summer. Yay, year-round soccer. That That's awesome. I, I mean, as a viewer and someone who looks at it as entertainment, yeah, it is awesome. As someone who's got to run this as a business and as the players who have to continue to play in it, Eh, maybe not as awesome. They're going to have to continue to relax the roster rules and add depth. Continuing on, sporting directors looking to buy players during the summer window have also complained that the U.S. summer window closes too early to fully leverage the market. With the MLS window closing before most European windows are shut off, teams often find that players want to wait to see all of their options, and it causes MLS teams to lose out on potential signings. MLS clubs essentially cannot benefit from the dominoes that fall later in the transfer window. I w quote, I wish our window was a little bit more friendly to us, end quote, Charlotte FC Sporting Director Zoran Cornetta told MLS Soccer this summer. I'm a big advocate for the window being moved to like September 5th because we would not only have way more chances to pick up really good players, but we'd also have a chance to pick up the players that suddenly are surplus to requirements. Sometimes with those deals that fail in the last two days, the club's like, okay, what do we do now? It would be really 
it would really be a smart move by American clubs in Major League Soccer. The league was keen to change it this year, but they couldn't for various other reasons. But this is where we need to go to be super competitive. End quote. So there you go. Charlotte FC is on board with the change. While the transfer window is determined by the Canadian Soccer Association and U.S. Soccer, not MLS, a move to a fall spring schedule could help alleviate some of those issues. And we are about halfway through this article, so bear with me here as we continue to review everything that we that was written here on The Athletic. So now they look into how would the schedule change? With the changes, the MLS season would begin like most European leagues in early August. The first portion of the schedule would run through mid-December before taking a winter break, likely around five weeks long. The season would resume in early February and run through the spring with MLS Cup in late May. A schedule change would flip the MLS playoffs and the MLS Cup to a less crowded portion of the American sports schedule. A warm weather MLS Cup with less competition from other sports leagues is certainly appealing to all. Yes, I want, I've said it about the NFL. People say, why do they play the Super Bowl in the same four or five cities? I'm like, because they want the best players playing in the best conditions. And I want the same thing for MLS. I want the best players playing in the best conditions. As fun and novel as some of these like cold weather snow championship games are, mm -mm, too much variable. I want the players to decide, not the weather. All right, the, the article goes on. A fall spring calendar would also mean that MLS, like the rest of the world, would pause the season during all FIFA international windows, which would be a welcome change for most teams and players. And hey, everybody, maybe that would get some of the U.S. internationals or other internationals to consider more strongly playing in Major League Soccer. If they have these windows that they wouldn't have to worry about not being released by their MLS clubs. That could be another benefit to changing the windows up and aligning with a more internationally recognized schedule here. Okay, we get another quote now from Nelson Rodriguez. The playoffs are the most valuable piece of real estate in a league season, and playoffs that would be spring or summer suggest a different dynamic. It starts with the fact that the weather is closer to optimal for all 30 clubs. Your stadium conflicts are a little bit less. Competition with other North American sports is different, and you're more aligned with at least the European rhythm of football. So those are factors. They also come with their own set of trade-offs. End quote. So again, some kind of general statements here. Um, nothing, nothing too detailed or revealing there. Uh, the league is also weighing the possibility of organizing teams into divisions instead of conferences and playing part of the schedule as interconference and interdivisional play only with playoff spots on the line. The second half of the season would then help determine full season playoff seeding and spots. Interesting. We've we've seen a call, especially with the Miami to Vancouver or the New York to LA flights here, we've seen a call for a little bit of a conference realignment or a divisional realignment where we see an East, West, and Central. And I think also if they want to try and build up some of these rivalries, that would be a great way to do it. Or maybe we see an East, West, North, and South uh, MLS. And now that we've got San Diego coming in to make it 30 teams, it's possibly going to be easier to even things out. All right, the final paragraph in this section. The MLS Players Association will play a crucial role in these discussions, and Rodriguez said the league is working with the MLSPA to ensure it gets player feedback. The league will need player sign-off on any schedule changes, especially because the collective bargaining agreement requires that each player is entitled to six weeks of vacation per year with five consecutive weeks of vacation time required. So they've got to get five weeks in a row of vacation time per the CBA. That's nice. And, and absolutely necessary for someone who's putting their body on the line each and every day in training and in matches and throughout the different tournaments and things, that five weeks is, is absolutely necessary for recovery, if not longer. Okay, what are the drawbacks? And this is the last portion of the article, and, and thanks for sticking around as I speed read through this. What are the drawbacks? The league would no longer play from around June 1st through July 15th, and it would replace those weeks of games with games from early November through mid-December. That might be welcomed by fans in cities like Dallas, Orlando, Miami, Houston, and Austin, but it would be difficult for markets like Toronto, Chicago, Minnesota, Salt Lake City, Montreal, and New England, which see the summer months as their most attractive and profitable weeks of the season. And, I, and let me interject here. I have seen Chicago fans on social media saying, like, a Chicago game on the lakefront in the summer? That is awesome. That is what... It is to be in Chicago in the summer, to be downtown, to be on the lakefront, to take in a, a match, a game, whatever it is, and, and just to enjoy your city. So if you're going to lose that for these fall or spring games, that's going to be a tough blow. And I wonder how that's going to impact uh, a lot of of Chicago fans and other fans in markets too, because you've got a lot of potential season ticket holders or 
half season ticket holders or six game package people who are doing things over the summer instead of during the fall and winter. That's going to be a big change. Hopefully they can get this done before Chicago builds its new stadium. They can put a dome on and, uh, you know, n nothing nothing worse here in Chicago. But anyway, let's continue with the article. That stadium discussion is for another another show. Sources involved in and briefed on discussions said there have been concern about a potential calendar change from certain MLS stakeholders that play in colder markets. The league hopes to gain more insight by surveying fans in different markets to determine whether they would go to games played in winter months, especially in those markets most impacted by the weather. So, hey, fire fans, be ready for your fan weather survey. While ticket sales would likely be impacted, there are also other logistical issues to consider, including the impact on training environments. Teams in colder climates might be forced to train inside on turf, for example. And as we know, uh, injuries are more susceptible on turf. And hey, thankfully, the Chicago Fire have built that new training facility. Uh, that can give them a little bit of an edge if this calendar change happens. Uh, but again, if they're training on turf, maybe that's not as enticing, especially to some of these more senior stars that come over to MLS for a couple years, not calling them aging or retiring, uh, but certain players, as we know, have been protected from playing on turf. Nelson Rodriguez, quote, again, any consideration set has a different impact across all our clubs, and so that becomes part of the balance. The greatest strength of our single entity system is our ability to work as partners off the field and our ability to evaluate our business, our business being commercial, sporting, and brand. And that has proven to be great aid in this process because there's been an amazing spirit of collaboration, not just internally among all departments at MLS, but among all our clubs, end quote. The article goes on. There are other hurdles to figure out as well. League's Cup is currently played for one month in the middle of the summer, interrupting the regular season. MLS is weighing different formats and timing for League's Cup that would fit into this new calendar, including potentially playing the tournaments in January and February with teams in pods in warmer weather locales like California, Texas, and Florida. Well, I guess that would help the Mexican teams who feel slighted that they don't get any home crowds. Uh, the league would also have to determine how the U.S. Open Cup and Canadian Championship fits into the new calendar, though MLS pulled back in its participation in the Open Cup this season. I, I think that's just, I don't think that's a huge issue of which MLS clubs are going to be in the Open Cup and, and Canadian Championship, depending on the schedule. Uh, I think it, it's just a matter of organizing and, and seeing who qualifies. Um, and, and maybe they'll have to do some random selections for the first year to get it synced up. All right, the article goes on. These issues could end up holding up the calendar switch. The league previously held discussions on a potential change in competition format in 2013 and 14. So, oh, so this has been going on for a bit, but opted not to make a change. With the World Cup around the corner, however, discussions about the calendar now feel like they have real momentum. Though Rodriguez cautioned it was simply too soon to know. Quote, we are at a different point in our evolution as a league, Rodriguez said. With the World Cup, we have more eyes on us than ever before, and so it has really been rewarding that no one has been territorial and everyone has been thoughtful and collaborative. I think there's a recognition that this is the right time to be doing this level of analysis, end quote, end article. And that is everything we know from Paul Tenorio over at The Athletic. Make sure you follow him at Paul Tenorio on Twitter. Uh, he writes for the athletic i'm sure you know him if if you've been following soccer at all in this country and with that i want to thank you all for tuning into this week's episode wishing all of your teams the best of luck in the playoffs hopefully you get to enjoy some of these great matches uh and some great action as we get ready to crown the next mls cup champion and as always let's go fire <laughs>